I don't see it otherwise. All right. Um, yes, uh, can I ask a brief question? Yes. Uh, I don't understand why in pro proposition the last what was it? Uh, this proposition. Uh, yes, in this proposition, why these yeah. three holes for norm? Uh, okay, so first I should say, so we only proved one direction and that's the only direction I'll actually use. So that's the only direction I'll prove. Uh, so let me replace this as, uh, oh, um, if you have a uh, relative property T, then there does not exist. So let me replace this that, uh, okay. Uh, so that's period. So if this has property T, relative property T, then there does not exist such a sequence. Uh, and uh, the proof of this, or wait, is it the other way around? Uh, if, er, if you don't have, no, other way around, sorry. If you do not have relative property T, then there does exist a sequence like this. So if does not have relative property, then there does exist a statement. I like this. Uh, so it is an if and only if, and the, the converse is also true, and it's not particularly difficult, but I want to avoid it just because I'm not going to use it. Uh, so I'll only prove this direction. Uh, so let me briefly outline the proof again. So uh, the idea is as follows. So suppose we do not have property T. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that there is some representation which has almost invariant vectors, uh, but does not have non-zero uh, invariant vectors for A. A is a sum subgroup. So we take this representation and we take these almost invariant vectors, and then we use the spectral theorem to realize that each, uh, each, almost, each vector, so these are unit vectors, and so they each give us a probability measure on the uh, dual group A hat. And this is uh, from the fact that um, we know that these C-star algebras are isomorphic, and we know that, uh, well, this is also isomorphic to the full group C-star algebra for abelian groups. Um, okay, and these C-star algebras are explicitly isomorphic by, via Fourier transform, but I haven't gone into that. Uh, that's, that's something that you can look up if you like. Um, uh, okay, so uh, we get these sequence of almost invariant vectors they give us this sequence of probability measures on the dual group. And then you just translate what is, uh, what does that give us? And you just verify these three properties. Uh, so I did that very briefly last time, uh, but what's the idea here? The idea for why does these, the sequence of probability measures, why do they all give weight zero to the identity element? And that's because if you work through what this correspondence is, uh, what the measure at the identity tells you is it tells you the inner product of this vector, or it tells you the, the norm of the projection of this vector onto the space of invariant vectors. But by hypothesis, there were no invariant vectors, right? Pi, uh, pi has no A invariant vectors. And so that directly gives you that this has zero. So I, this is kind of a hand wavy argument a little bit in the sense that I, uh, you know, these things are all should be sat down and you need to verify them rigorously. Um, but it's, I don't want to go into the too many details here because it involves using the Fourier transform or Fourier analysis. And, and so these are, um, I want to be able to move on quickly with the course. Um, but uh, the fact that these there's no A invariant vectors precisely tells you that these probability measures give weight mass zero to the identity. Uh, on the other hand, what do you know? You know that uh, these vectors are almost invariant for A. So what does that mean? So if you put A here, then this uh, converges to one uh, as you take the sequence to infinity. But what is pi of A here? Pi of A is exactly when we think of A as a function on the dual group, it's exactly integration 
with respect to this measure. So that says that these functions, and these functions are all one at the identity, they're, they're homomorphisms, they're one at the identity, but they also separate points. So the fact that you have convergence here to the constant one function exactly says that these measures uh, send everything to the Dirac mass at the identity asymptotically, or in other words, in weak star topology. So that's why you get this convergence to the weak star topology. That's because these vectors are almost invariant for A. But the other condition we have is that these vectors are also almost invariant for lambda, where lambda is acting on A. And what that means, that means if you put here a, a pi of A, or if you act on A by an element of lambda, well, if you act on A, uh, maybe there's, yeah, if you act on A, so lambda, remember here, is acting on A. And if you put here some A, and then you put T, a t inverse, where say t is in lambda, uh, then what you get is that pi of this, it's a homomorphism, so this is the action. Uh, so this is another element in A. So you know that this inner product, this, on one hand, this is the integral of a chi d uh, mu n chi, oh, sorry, not not to put the action. So this is the integral of T A T inverse chi D mu n mu C n chi. So that's on one hand, but on the other hand, we use the fact that this is a homomorphism and the fact that the uh, C n's are almost invariant for the T this is approximately equal to the same thing without the T. So this is approximately equal to pi A, C N, C N, which is the integral of A, uh, chi, D mu, C N, chi. And of course here, you can rewrite this by a change of variables. This is the integral A, chi, and now D, T, and then we have the push forward of T of this action T, mu Xn. And the thing to notice is that this uh, approximation here only depends on the norm, uh, the, dif the difference in norm between pi of, pi of n. So this approximation uh, is up to pi T Xn minus Xn. So it's uniform in A, in other words. So this approximation is uniform in A, uh, hence you can take all L1 functions by taking the span of things in A. So what you get is you get uh, an inequality between this and this. So what you end up getting is that you get the integral of f, um, f of chi, I'll write it as f of chi, uh, f of chi, and now you have d mu xn, minus uh, the push forward with respect to t mu cn with respect to chi, you get this and absolute value is less than or equal to some constant which goes to zero times the L1 norm of f. So you get it, uh, you get it for the whole L1 norm of f since it's uniform in A. And then you see that this is exactly saying that, so this is the L1 norm of f, so the f uh, the Fourier transform here is then it's the L infinity norm of the Fourier transform. And so that tells you exactly that you get the probability norm here. So from this, you see that the norm minus the push forward goes to zero. So that's, uh, that's adding more details that I left off from last time. So that's how you see the third condition, which is maybe the trickiest to see, but uh, like I said, I didn't want to go into too many details of the, of the dual group and, and Pontryagin and duality and all that. All right, so hopefully that uh, helps to clear things up. Uh, so that's how you get the third uh, condition. Uh, and then as a corollary, you get the following. And like I said, the converse is also true, but I'm not going to prove, I'm not going to prove the converse of this. 
Uh, and then as the corollary, you get the following. That is that if you do not have prop relative property T, then there exists a finitely additive probability measure on the space of Borel subsets of the dual group uh, with the following three properties. One is that it gives uh, measure zero to the identity element. Uh, it's lambda invariant. And the third is that it, even though it gives measure zero to the identity elements, it gives measure one to any neighborhood containing the identity. So it's kind of concentrated in, um, you know, it's concentrated as, as close to the identity as, as possible, except that the identity itself is, is weight zero. Um, so this in a, so of itself is not any sort of contradiction at all because it's only finitely additive. It's not countably additive. Uh, however, we'll see that this leads to a, a contradiction using a paradoxical decomposition. And how do you get this corollary? Well, I wrote the proof right here. All you do is you just realize that finally additive measures on the space of Borel subsets, you can identify this with states on this c star algebra, the c star algebra of bounded Borel functions. And, and this is a nice, well, it states on a unital C star algebra, so it's a nice compact in the weak star topology space. And so all you do is you take these measures and you take some weak star limit of them by banach -Lagle. And then you see that these things which held up to epsilon then hold everywhere. Okay, so that's this corollary. And we'll see directly from this corollary that this is why uh, uh, z squared sitting inside of SL2 z semi direct product z squared has relative property t. In fact, that's the theorem we can do right now. So here's the, the theorem. And that is that this pair of uh, SL2 z semi direct product z squared together with z squared uh, has relative property t. Uh, and then we'll, uh, yeah, we can give a proof of this. So notice that this is in the situation. So the action of SL2Z on Z squared is just usual matrix multiplication. Um, but uh, of course, Z, so SL2Z acts on Z squared, which uh, by matrix multiplication. And we can identify the dual group of z squared with z mod, uh, sorry, r mod z, r mod z squared. So that's the, the dual group of z squared, where the pairing between z squared and its dual group is just coming from uh, the inner product of, you know, some vector v1 with v2, uh, the corresponding pairing is just e to the two pi i times their dot product. All right, so that's the identification between these two groups as, as dual to each other. Um, and so then what do we see here? Well, we see that the action of SL2Z on Z squared is matrix multiplication. Uh, but if matrix multiplication, you move it to the other side, you just get the transpose um, and of course, also on the dual group, in order to get an action, you take the inverse. So the action of the action of SL2Z on uh, R mod Z squared uh, is uh, matrix multiplication by inverse transpose. So that's the dual action that we get on this space. And then, uh, and then what can we do? Well, now we're in the setting of the previous corollary. So we say, uh, if we do not have relative property T, so then there exists a finitely additive uh, measure probability measure M on the space of Borel subsets 
of R mod Z squared such that M at the identity element uh, E is equal to zero. Uh, M is SL2Z invariant. And M of O is equal to one for any neighborhood of the identity element, any Borel neighborhood of the identity element. Uh, okay, so how can we uh, view this? So we're, we're have the two torus here, but we have the identity element on the two torus and we know that everything is supported, everything is concentrated in any neighborhood of the identity there. So therefore we can just cut out a neighborhood and pretend it's sitting in the plane since it's just matrix multiplication. So we can identify, uh, specifically we'll identify the torus with the square here, where I'll put the origin in the middle here. So these vertices will be negative one half, one half, uh, negative one half. Here's one half, negative one half, one half, one half, and negative one half. So we have, and here's the origin in the middle. So uh, this is the torus, so we identify sides, but actually it doesn't matter. We can think of it just as the plane because we know that our, our measure is supported uh, in any neighborhood of the identity, which, which already lives in the plane. Uh, so what can we do here? Well, we have the SL2Z acts on this by matrix multiplication, and we just want to come up with some paradoxical decomposition of the square. So we've removed the origin, so, uh, because it gives mass, so maybe let me put an open circle there. We've removed the origin uh, because it has mass zero at the origin, and this is where our measure lives. So here's what we can do. We can consider the following set. So consider the following sets. So maybe I'll use different colors to, uh, emphasize these sets. So A, this is gonna be the set of all, the set of vectors x, y, such that uh, x is greater than zero and y lives between uh, negative x and x. And then we're gonna have, uh, say B, And this will be the set of pairs x, y, such that uh, this time y will be greater than zero and x will live between negative y and uh, y. And then we're gonna have c, and this is going to be the set of x, y, such that x is less than zero. And now we have x less than or equal to y, less than negative x. And finally we have d, which is the set of x and y, such that y is less than zero, and y is less than x is less than or equal to negative y. All right, so let me draw these in the plane. Uh, so we see in the first one, x is greater than zero and y lives between uh, negative x and x. So we, here's the line y equals negative x. Here's the line y equals x. And this is where a lives right in here. And then b, x is, uh, y is greater than zero and x lives between negative y and y. So we see that that's gonna be exactly, and we have the dotted line here, the solid line here, and this is the set B. And then C, we have, hopefully I've defined it in a way that we get to exclude that dotted line, put this solid line there, C. 
And then finally, uh, D should be this set right there. All right, so we've partitioned the plane into four disjoint Borel sets. Uh, so now the thing to notice is that if we look at this, uh, these sets, one, zero, 2K, one, and apply this to A, and let's see what happens when we do this. Well, in this case, well, what is one, zero, 2K, one? This leaves the first variable the same, so this leaves X the same, and then it just adds 2KX to Y. So this is gonna be the set of X pairs XY such that X is the same, so X can be any positive real number. But now the second coordinate is going to be the old coordinate plus 2KX, so you're gonna get uh, 2K minus one X less than Y less than or equal to 2K plus one X. So that's what this set is here. Um, and similar, so the thing to notice here is that uh, these sets are pairwise disjoint. These are pairwise disjoint for k is a natural number. Um, but what does that mean? That means that if this, whatever this measure on A is, well, we know it has to be the same as the measure on all these translates. We've translated A by elements of the groups, but these are all pairwise disjoint, so we see that it can't be positive because if it had positive measure to A, then eventually by finding additivity, you could get a set with as large of measure as possible, but it's a probability measure, so it can't have measure more than one. So the fact that these are pairwise disjoint, this implies that whatever this measure is, the measure of the set A is equal to zero. But then you check similarly, if you look at uh, one, zero, two K, one uh, C times C, you'll see that these are also paired. So A, uh, when you apply this transformation one, two K, or one, zero, two K, one to A, you're gonna get these, you know, sets up and B. It kind of moves every slice, slants everything up. You get these sort of, you know, this sort of picture where you just get this um, tiling. Uh, and similarly on C, you're going to move everything down in that case. So you're going to get this, these pairwise disjoint sets as well. So these are also going to be pairwise disjoint. So again, you have that the measure of C is also equal to zero. And you can do a similar trick with B and D, except you have to use different transformations. Uh, specifically, if you use one, two K, zero, one, apply to B. Well, this transformation, what does it do? This one leaves Y the same, and then it shifts X by 2K times Y. So you see that the roles of X and Y are just reversed. And again, these are pairwise disjoint uh, pairwise. And similarly, one, two K, zero, one, D. Uh, but we see that gives a contradiction. Because we've just shown that the sets A, B, C, and D individually have mass zero, but they also uh, form a disjoint union of the whole space. Uh, so therefore the whole space has mass zero, contradicting the fact that it's a probability measure. All right, so there's a paradoxical decomposition hidden in this uh, uh, language. That's the fact that you can get these pairwise disjoint exactly says that there's a paradoxical decomposition. So this is just like when we showed free groups were not amenable. Um, we showed that there was no finitely additive invariant measure on free groups. This is a similar phenomenon. Uh, okay, so that, uh, that gives a contradiction. And so the conclusion is that this uh, subgroup uh, does indeed have relative property T. Now the next uh, theorem, the next main theorem that I want to get to is that SL3Z and, and SLNZ itself uh, has 
property T. Um, but to do that, uh, I think in the most efficient way possible, I need to give a new characterization of property T that we haven't seen yet. So before Can I ask a question? Yes. So, uh, uh, so it seems that uh, you can also say the SLNZ cross brother with ZN and ZN has relative property by using this method? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I think that's correct. And um, uh, yeah, you can even see it even easier because uh, each and say SLNZ semi-direct ZN, uh, there are many copies of Z2 that sit inside there, Z2 cross SL2Z. And so you can use this result already there. In fact, uh, speaking of generalizations of this result, uh, this result has been generalized quite a bit uh, so that what is now true is even the following. Uh, so we have the theorem. Uh, I won't prove it and I'm not sure who proved the most general form of this. So there was a proof by Shalom under some additional restrictions and then I think uh, Yves Cornulier re re reduced some of these but I, I don't know who came up with the finer final form, it might be um, uh, Kosovo uh, who came up with the most general form. Uh, but uh, that is that if you look at um, uh, SL2Z, uh, no, sorry, what am I saying? You want, if you take any, if R is any, oh, now I'm gonna maybe forget how the right way to write this. Uh, I think you just might need it uh, finally generated as a ring. I think it's if you have R any finitely generated ring. So then if you look at EL, to R, so these are, this is the group generated by elementary matrices. Um, and this, again, you have here that this acts on R2, and, uh, and then you can look at R2, so you have that this has relative T. I believe it's that general at this point, uh, so that, that you even have this. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's fine. The, the statement I wrote down. I think I think, uh, I think this is Shalom's result, right? I uh, no, and this generality, this is cost above. Okay. Um. So Shalom proved a special case of this, and uh, I think Shalom proved that uh, El. N R E L N uh, Z, and then you adjoin, say, indeterminates X1 through XK, and then you consider this. So for this group, where I think N is uh, more than K plus two or something like this, this is what Shalom proved. Uh, but of course, this fits into this more general theorem, which has no uh, no problems on the number of generators or anything. Uh, so I believe that's Kosovo and you can you can look that up. It's actually almost, it's a very, very similar proof to the one I just gave you for SL2C. You again use the fact that, so here R2 is the additive group here. Uh, so you first pr prove that you can do it enough, it's enough to do it for these kind of universal uh, lattices. And, uh, and there you have a nice description of, so R2 is, this is the abelian group, and you have a nice description of the dual group, and you have a nice description of the action on the dual group, and then you construct a paradoxical decomposition similar to what I gave here. So this, this proof actually is, is not so far away from uh, Kosovo's uh, general proof. Um, yeah, but that's something fun if you want to look that up. I, I have one question. Yes. Do you have an explicit example like of, of a pair that does not have relative T and I mean, how would that measure? Sure, well, we, we, saw, uh, we saw that, uh, prop, uh, so if you're amenable, the left regular representation has almost invariant vectors. And if you take any subgroup of an amenable group, then the left regular representation is gonna have invariant vectors for the subgroup, 
if and only if that subgroup is finite. So for amenable groups, the subgroups with relative property T are exactly the finite subgroups. So that's one concrete example. Uh, we'll see other concrete, concrete examples as well. Um, well, I mean, uh, for instance, free groups sitting on a site itself does not have relative T because that would be property T. And we showed before that anything with property T has um, finite abelianization. So that's another example, for instance. Yeah, so we'll, yeah, okay. Uh, so the next result, major result uh, I wanna I get to. another question. Uh, sorry, oh, so, sure. so, so this proof doesn't, I think it's uh, Kent proof that SL2Z doesn't have property T, right? Correct, SL2Z does not have property T. Uh, SL2Z, so there's a few ways to see this. Uh, one uh, way to see this is that it's, while it's, not a free group itself, it does contain a finite index free group. And, uh, and of course, uh, you can show pretty easily that if a group has property T, then a finite index subgroup would also have property T. Um, so that's maybe one of the easiest ways to see that SL2Z doesn't have property T. Okay, okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. So the next theorem I want to get to is that uh, SL3Z has property T, uh, but we won't prove this right away because I wanna give a new formulation of property T before I can give, before I'll give a proof of uh, this theorem. Um, so this theorem is actually, I don't believe this is due to Kajdan in the sense that Kajdan, I think uh, in his original paper, uh, I think he he proved that the la the, SL4R in a higher head T. And I believe SL3R was maybe another mathematician a year or two after Kajdan, but I can't remember the, the actual mathematician. Uh, you can look that up. Uh, but okay, so before we do this, we're gonna reformulate property T in a different language because I wanna give a slick proof of this uh, due to Shalom. Um, okay, so let me, uh, let me switch gears then for a little bit and let's talk about positive definite functions. So if S is a set, so then a map phi mapping S times S to the complex numbers is of positive type. If when we think of phi as a matrix, it's a non-negative definite matrix. So in other words, if the matrix, matrix ST, so this is a matrix with entries in S and T, is non-negative definite. So what do I mean by that? This is possibly an infinite matrix. I mean, when you restrict to any finite submatrix, it should be non-negative definite. Or you can write this out explicitly. So IE for all alpha one through alpha n complex numbers, and for all S1 through Sn in the set S, we have that the sum as I and J go from one to N of alpha j bar alpha i phi of s i s j should be greater than or equal to zero. Right. So that's explicitly what I mean uh, by the matrix being non-negative non definite. All right, so pos uh, functions of positive type uh, come up quite frequently. And uh, here's a nice proposition. Uh, so this is like a, a GNS construction. So we've already seen GNS construction come up once. This is one theme you'll see throughout the course is that the GNS construction in various forms will come up a number of times. You also see that paradoxical decompositions uh, in varying states. These are also themes that you'll see come up over and over again throughout the course. Uh, so here's the corresponding GNS construction here. This is like a GNS type construction. And it says, uh, so if uh, phi maps S times S 
to the complex numbers. So then B is of positive type, or sometimes people say it's positive definite. Uh, so it's a positive type if and only if uh, there exists some map from S to H, a Hilbert space, such that phi of ST is exactly equal to the inner product of CS with CT. All right, so that's, uh, this is like the GNS construction. Um, so we have a nice classification of functions of positive type. Uh, and it has a very simple proof, just like all the GNS construction type results have. Uh, so one direction is more or less obvious if you have a function of this form. Uh, so then you could see, we wanna show that all these numbers I've written here are positive, so let's just compute it. Uh, sum from i and j goes from one to n of alpha j bar alpha i. Uh, and then we have here inner product c s i c s j. And then you can see you can move the alpha i's on one side, move the alpha j's into the other side. And you see that this is nothing but a norm of the vector sum as i goes from one up to n of alpha i c is i squared, which is greater than or equal to zero. So that's one direction. If you have a function of this form, then it's of positive type. Uh, and then the other direction, uh, what you can do is you can use this equation over here uh, to define an inner product on the group ring. So we define this inner product on the group ring, or sorry, not group ring, set ring, just the vector space spanned by elements of the set. There's no groups here. Uh, define an inner product on the, on the span of the set uh, by the inner product of some, some i goes from one to n alpha i s i, and sum as j goes from one to m uh, beta j T j is equal to the sum over i and j going from one to n and m respectively of alpha of beta j bar alpha i b of s i t j. All right, so that's clearly a bilinear form on this vector space. And you see that the way that it's chosen is precisely that this condition star implies that this is a non-negative definite bilinear form. Uh, so whenever you have a non-negative definite bilinear form on a vector space, you get a Hilbert space by quotienting out by the kernel. If there's a kernel, things that their inner product with themselves is equal to zero. And then you, and then you, um, you get a an, an genuine inner product. And so you can take the completion. So we just said H to be this set uh, modulo the kernel of this inner product, and then we take the completion with respect to the Hilbert space along here. So this is a Hilbert space, and now we have a map. So C mapping S to the Hilbert space is just given by uh, by C of a point S is just, well, S is a element of this vector space, and of course you're pushing it out, so you look at the equivalence class uh, given, given by S. And I claim that this is exactly what we want, and indeed, if you just check what is the inner product of Cs with Ct, you see by definition, so this is the inner product of the equivalence class of S with the equivalence class of T, but by definition of the inner product, this is just V of ST. All right, so that's the GNS construction. Uh, so if, if S is a bit more than the set, if it's a group, so note if gamma is a group, um, 
So uh, phi mapping gamma to the complex numbers is of positive type. If the map which takes, uh, my pen just died, I forgot to charge it before. Okay. Well, it's probably good because I think time is, time is up. Uh, so what I was just going to say is that uh, uh, we just look at the map on pairs, ST, which gets sent from ST to T inverse S, and then we would ask that that be positive definite. And then what happens in the construction over here is we see that gamma preserves the gamma acting by left multiplication preserves the center product, and hence you get a representation of the group. And so, uh, and then you get a um, uh, yeah. So it uh, says that every positive type function on a group comes from a group representation. Uh, so I'll maybe make this more explicit next time. All right. So any questions?